My name is Jeff Hemming. I'm an artist in the San Francisco Bay Area, and uh, this is a finished painting, uh, recently finished, of uh, Illuit Falls in Yosemite, looking down towards the uh, back of Half Dome. And I uh, got the idea for this painting on a hike I did a couple years ago with a couple friends. And uh, in this video, I basically want to just try, uh, break down my painting process on how I, how I do a landscape painting. Um, this particular one right here. Uh, so I'm going to go through start to finish uh, colors I use, uh, techniques, the brushes I use, materials I use, um, how I do the sky, how I do the mountains, how I do uh, glazes and scumbling and uh, things like that, um, how I set up a composition and changes I make. This isn't necessarily a tutorial, it's just how I do a landscape painting. Uh, this is the way that I, I've kind of learned um, through both trial and error and um, through school. Um, and this is the way uh, I like to paint. I've seen a lot of different techniques out there and you just have to find the right one that works for you. So hopefully you like the video and uh, we'll get this going and uh, we'll go start to finish on this painting right here. Thanks. So for this canvas, I'm using some heavy duty uh, Dick Blick stretcher bars and some 12 ounce uh, heavy duty canvas. It's a uh, 36 by 48. And I like the 12 ounce uh, canvas, it just feels like it's a little bit durable. So I stretch the canvas out and then I get it all primed up. I use a, a Utrecht uh, gallery uh, gesso to prime it and I use a squeegee to apply um, the gesso. And then I'll uh, give it like a couple more coats with the squeegee and then sand it down between each one so it's like a real nice smooth finish. Uh, once that's done, I'll apply my colored ground, and my colored ground is a mixture of chromance white or lead white and a Mars red, which is kind of an iron oxide red. And I'll let it, uh, once I get it all mixed up, I'll slather it on a piece of cardboard. And what that does is it kind of sucks a little bit of the uh, oil out of the paint, and it kind of keeps the oil away from the canvas. So this colored ground is called the uh, Imprimatura. I just apply it on there with some solvent and uh, then I'm ready to go. Next thing I kind of do is I'll, um, once it dries, a couple days later, uh, I'll use a big fat piece of charcoal, piece of fine charcoal, and I will just start sketching in real loose uh, the composition. And uh, for this particular painting, I'm using a bunch of different photos I had from a hike I did. It was around the Panorama Trail uh, in Yosemite, and you get this nice uh, view of Illouette Falls at the back of Half Dome, and all these uh, cool ridges that kind of fall down into this valley that eventually leads down into a Yosemite Valley. Once I get it sketched in, um, I'll start my first layer of paint, and it's kind of this monochromatic underpainting is called the it's called the dead layer or the uh, grisaille, and I use again I use the flake white or the cremens white and uh, burnt umber, and I just mix up three different. I mix up three different tones, a light, a medium, and a dark, and this is a really important step in painting because it helps you lay out where your light colors are going to be, your middle ground, and then your dark colors, and it kind of lets you see where everything needs to be laid out. If there's any changes to the composition that need to be made, you can make it during this um, during this stage. So uh, this gets all put in really loosely. I don't want to I don't want to worry about any detail right now. And the next thing I'll do is um, I'll mix up a lot of. Uh, burnt sienna with a lot of solvent. Burnt sienna is very transparent and I'll give it kind of a wash over the entire thing after it dries and this just kind of helps to unify the whole painting and it, and it kind of helps me um, darken up the darks a little bit more and it adds another little bit of layer of detail to uh, the texture that I've created. Um, I'll go in and lighten up the sky a little bit. I usually want the, the lights coming from the sky. The sky is my main light source so um, I'll mix a little bit of white in the sky uh, to brighten up that area. And then I know I'm gonna have a rainbow in the bottom of it, kind of uh, coming from the, the waterfall. And so I'm using a string attached to the brush, attached to a pin to the bottom of the canvas to create the arc for the, uh, for the rainbow. And I'm just using some lead white to, uh, to create the rainbow because I want that to be brighter. So I'll do a little bit of underpainting on that rainbow to keep it brighter. So what I'm using here is I'm going to be making a couple of uh, color swatches. I use these for um, just remembering colors that are used for landscapes. So uh, these are going to be my uh, kind of my sky colors right here. Um, so I've been using a, I've been using a titanium white um, for the sky, and I'm mixing it with um, 
uh, Van Dyke Brown. I usually use um, Ultramarine Blue, but uh, for this one I want it kind of a cooler sky, so I'm going to use Prussian Blue. I'm going to use Prussian Blue, and I've mixed it with a little bit of uh, um, Cadmium Red Deep. That's all of these um, have been mixed. This is going to be my white color. Uh, mixed with both a little bit of the blue and a little bit of the uh, uh, red ochre and the Van Dyke Brown and um, The yellow kind of functions as a little bit of green Sometimes it's good to have a little bit of that green tint to that sky a little bit of green in that sky kind of pushes it back a little bit especially when you're doing like clouds um, and then it'll greens the opposite of red so most of my Landscape area is gonna be red so the green will it'll come off of it a little bit, so. Once I get the sky filled in, I'll go back and I'll use the same colors um, for the very, like the farthest back mountains that are back there. I want those to have just like the same colors and I'll add um, a touch of Van Dyke Brown to them to just darken them up a little bit, but I don't want any I really don't want any color. I don't want a lot of detail on them. So um, the, the background mountains are essentially just a, an extension of the sky using the same colors. Um, and again, I don't want any detail. They need to, they need to sit farther back um, so that all of the, all the closer ridges are going to have all the color to it. So they get scrubbed in um, and then I'll start adding some of the color uh, as I work forward from, uh, from the sky layer. As I work closer, I'm still using the same uh, sky colors for the mountains and I'm adding just a little bit more of the um, burnt umber with a little bit of Ross, or, uh, burnt sienna and then I'm adding a touch of uh, sap green, just a little bit of sap green into um, uh, the areas with the trees and I'm using a really small liner brush. My liner brush is kind of just a big mess. It's not really, it doesn't come to a fine point. So it has kind of a cool mark. It's like got a unique mark to it just because it's an old liner brush and it's kind of frayed out, um, but it's good for that background texture. Again, I don't want to have too much detail uh, in the painting at this point because all this, that all this like back ridge has to sit farther back and you want to have less detail uh, in the background. Uh, my my go-to red for landscape painting is this right here. This is the secret red right here, right there. It's my favorite red. Um, red ochre, it is extremely potent. It's Williamsburg, it's very expensive. But if you look down at the bottom here, it's not really expensive. It's a series one. So it's one of the cheaper Williamsburg paints that you can get. Uh, it's heavy um, and it's, it's very opaque. And uh, it's, uh, it's a really nice warm red. So I'm using this for a lot of the, um, uh, a lot of the uh, underpainting that I've done so far. Use a little bit of uh, Van Dyke Brown is a really good way to uh, knock down some of the brightness and you can kind of create um, shades uh, using Van Dyke Brown. So I use Van Dyke Brown in some of the areas, um, darker areas, the grays, uh, the darker areas of the clouds in the background, ivory black. Um, just a touch just a little bit. I don't I don't like just using straight black, but sometimes I just want it just for that gray I like that uh, just straight white and black gray build up. I am using uh, a rose matter lake for some of the bits in the sky um, Discount uh, rose matter lake because um, it's a little bit thinner uh, It's more of a it's a it's a lake. So it has transparent qualities to it um, If you don't know what a lake is a lake is basically a material that they crush up and they dye the material with some sort of dye and then they mix that material into uh, the binder, and that's what's. Uh, so it's not like a, it's not like a thing. It's not like a pigment or a dye based. It's not like a pigment based, but it's kind of a mix between. So they dye the material first, and then mix the material into the binder, and that is how they make what is called a lake. I don't generally use um, phthalo green, but I am using a little tiny, tiny, tiny bit of phthalo green, mostly because it's cool. It's a very icy green, emeraldy green, 
and uh, I'm using it a little bit in the sky to offset a little bit of that red and um, usually when you're doing like mountain sky sometimes when you get big thick clouds there will be uh, they almost, the, the grays of the clouds will kind of have this like a uh, greenish color to it. So I really like it's that water matter that's uh, water material that's up in there. So here's my right here. Um, this is my uh, um, little tiny bit of phthalo blue, or excuse me, phthalo green. This is my um, uh, Prussian blue right here mixed in. I'm using titanium white. Um, and this is my uh, little bit of uh, Van Dyke Brown and a little bit of black that was right there. Here's my red ochre and here is my um, Rose Matter Lake. And these are the colors that I've mixed up, um, about five different colors for uh, the sky and the background. Um, when I move forward in the foreground, I'm going to start introducing, um, you know, I'll start introducing some more yellow. The yellow I usually use is just a cadmium yellow or a lemon yellow. Okay, so far I've got um, the blue filled in, background, sky, clouds, uh, background textures all filled in. And um, I'm going to be starting to put in some of this foreground here, um, um, some of the cliffs. Uh, the rainbow area will get laid in. Hopefully that works out. If it doesn't, we'll just take it out. Don't need to worry about it. Um, but yeah, this is pretty much it. So um, just real quick, here are the differences between, um, if you look at uh, the differences between uh, a Prussian blue. So you can see these, you have this tropical underwater painting I've been working on for the last few months in the back. Um, this painting here, the sky here, was done with the uh, ultramarine blue. Okay. And uh, the sky here, this guy here was finished with the uh, um, with the Prussian blue, so you can see the difference in hue. Um, this one's much more warmer, and then this one, the Prussian blue, is much colder. Um, ultramarine, French ultramarine, cobalt blue tends to be kind of really warm, um, and then your Prussian blue, your phthalo blue, and uh, tend to be kind of cool, and then um, you know your cerulean blue tends to be kind of green, but it also really works for like a nice sky once in a while. So those are, that's the blue, that's the difference in blue. Um, next part I'm gonna be doing here is working on this uh, background clip here and uh, this. So I've got all these bits put in. Next stop is to get some of the detail on these things laid in. Light's gonna be kind of coming from this way, coming kind of coming in this way. dark for my rock ground areas um, and then I want to have a light in the dark for my green areas so what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to use my existing light and dark that I use for the very farthest background I'm going to keep my light over here and keep my light here and I'll probably add a little bit of uh, maybe a touch of yellow to it yeah, uh, and then this one's going to be my dark here and I'm gonna add a little bit of a touch of Van Dyke Brown to it. I'm gonna add a little bit of that sky blue. This is some of the, from the sky that I had. I'll add a little bit of that so there's a little bit of continuity. Cools it down, it's still not quite in the foreground yet. So a little bit of that. And then here's our middle ground that we're gonna be using. Here's our dark. That we're gonna be using. I'll leave that one there. So this is gonna be my new. I added some. I'm gonna add some dark green here. Okay, that's good. And then our light green. So that's gonna be. That's gonna be like our trees coming up out of there. process for painting like blocking in the mountains is I usually will start with kind of like a darker color first um, not the darkest color but just a, like kind of a darker uh, color and then I'll scrub that in really loosely and then when I go back I'll, I'll kind of look at reference photos and then with like a, a lighter color not like the brightest color but a lighter color for my palette I'll start like scrubbing in highlights over the top of it really loosely I don't want to have like 
I don't want to try to like make the rocks with a brush. I want to let, I kind of want to just let the brush mark make texture that I can then turn into forms and rocks and things like that. So the, all the rock goes down first, maybe two or three tones of the rock, the, the, the mountain, like the dirt. And then on top of that, I'll go back in and put into two different colors for the trees. Uh, the tree foliage is like going to be the green part and the rock in this case is like the, the orange and brown part. So the rock goes down first and then I'll go kind of just lace the trees on top of the areas um, that I created with the rocks. So I'm just kind of filling in the parts of the ridge that are in like the very farthest back part and I still have that same color mixed up on my palette so it's kind of important to keep the colors that you're using um, so you can go back and if you need to touch something up or paint something out so I had I had the uh, color still mixed on my palette so I'm just going in here and um, kind of touching up and cleaning up that edge so it meets the edge that's in the front of it So this is going to be kind of the closest ridge on the right side and this is where uh illuit falls is going to be and it kind of squeaks down right in between a small little crack and then it kind of it kind of poofs out into a really wide fall if there's a lot of water falling so i'm looking at uh, a couple of reference photos that i have from my hike to make sure i get like the configuration of the rocks right and the light on the rocks and the shadow on the rocks but i'm just blocking them in the same way i did the ridge to the back and uh, because it's closer, I'm using a little bit darker color, adding a little bit uh, more Van Dyke Brown to it and a touch more of the green to the trees and a touch of yellow is going to go into it now. Yellow kind of gets closer. Uh, I usually use yellow as I get closer to the foreground. Um, if it's just like a normal everyday uh, setting, if it's a sunset, then yellow is going to be going in the back. But for this one, it's just going to be reserved for um, the colors up in the kind of the closer foreground. Here I'm just adding kind of a, I guess you would call it a glaze. Um, I'm just adding a very thin layer of paint um, using some um, burnt sienna and probably some Van Dyke Brown mixed in there. Um, and I'm mixing it with the uh, Liquin original and I just want to kind of knock it down a little bit and sometimes I'll do this if I want to, if I want to change the color of a certain area or if I just want to add to the amount of detail and layers that are going to be visible. Um, sometimes if you just throw a, a glaze over part of the over part of the rocks, after you're finished painting it, some parts are have the glaze, some parts don't. And it just kind of, I feel like it adds to the richness of it and adds, it's an easy way to add like kind of a, a little bit more of dimension and detail. So the ridge on the left side kind of started getting a little bit confusing. So when that's the case, I'll, I'll kind of walk away from it for a little bit. I'll let it dry and then I'll come back and I'll look at some reference photos or reference sketches that I have. And um, instead of just painting in, sometimes if I'm if I want to get something really exactly perfect or exactly the way I want it, I'll uh, I'll get a piece of like white charcoal and draw right over the, the dried oil painting. And this kind of just helps me remember and see things where they need to be. And then I'll start filling in the same way I did before. I'll fill in the dark areas and then um, go back, fill in lighter areas as highlights and then start adding detail with smaller brushes. Um, but I really like to let the brush texture do the work for the rock texture. Instead of trying to paint 
all of the little crags and things like that. If you have a really crappy brush, you can kind of hit it and drag it almost like a, you know, same, same way Bob Ross would make his mountains with the, with a palette knife. Um, let the, let the tool, let the brush do the work with the texture. And I find that is a lot easier than trying to create all of the crags with a small brush. Getting close to being done. Um, I like all of this over here so far. Uh, waterfall is going to get put in at some point. Um, before I do any of this, obviously, this will get darkened up. Waterfall, a little bit more mist. This is going to stay. The thing that's bothering me right now, I worked on these rocks. They've all got to go. I don't like them anymore. When I was doing them, I like the texture of them. I like the actual individual shape of them, but the scale of them is off. The, there's not enough. Um, they're they're out of proportion. They kind of flatten everything out here. So. I'm going to have a bigger cliff up here. It's going to be smaller and it's going to push everything back. It's going to give it more of a, um, it's, these, the size of these rocks make everything else look really small because of this like proportion that I'm dealing with here with this and this and this and this. So, um, I want to make these smaller. It's going to make everything else look bigger. Um, perspective and proportion here is what we're dealing with. So, um, I also want, there's too much things right in front. And I want to be able to like kind of walk into it. So right in here, I like this. I really like this rock, but it's got to go. So right in here, I'm going to have a kind of a, not like a trail, but maybe like a little bit of kind of a walkway, an area where you could walk here and a couple levels and it's going to go up here. So I'm going to start working on that tonight. That's what I'm going to do tonight. Um, try to get this all mapped up. This is all got to go. I spent like a couple hours working on this part and it's got to go. So here's my tip. No matter how long you work on something, if it doesn't look good, if it doesn't work, I don't care, you gotta change it or you, you gotta get rid of it. And I'll start just punching in some of these areas that I want to just knock down a little bit. This cliff is a little bit too far in the back. I just don't want any, I don't want any detail fighting with anything in the foreground. So I'm going to do, I'm going to make it a little bit darker. Some over here. You can kind of just push these back a little bit. This one will be, I can let this one get brighter. Um, So for the trees, I usually start with the kind of the main trunk and I'll give it like a light and a dark side and then I'll start filling in the branches and different clumps of uh, different clumps of trees based off of sketches or based off of photos that I take. Um, I really like trees that have kind of a lot of character to them, have like they're kind of, they're not very symmetrical or they have like a bunch of branches on one side or they've been hit by lightning or they have like a weird growth pattern to them. So I'm always attracted to those trees. I feel like they make uh, more of an interesting painting. And then uh, just give them, give each part of the tree like a light and a dark side and put some highlights on it wherever it needs it.
Next I'll start uh, putting in uh, the top of Illouette Falls with a little liner brush using kind of like, it's uh, using a white color but it's not quite white so I'm mixing it with a little bit of blue. I don't want it, I don't want it just straight white because it is kind of in the shadow um, in this particular setup. Illouette Falls falls from Illouette Creek which runs uh, north just below uh, Glacier Point. So if you go to Glacier Point you can actually hike down to the right, uh, I think it's about two miles and you can get down to the top of the creek up there and then it gushes over this cliff and then it eventually uh, runs down and connects with um, Vernal Falls and Nevada Falls and eventually flows down into uh, Yosemite Valley connecting with the uh, Merced River. So next I'm gonna I'm gonna block in the kind of closest foreground which is going to be the bottom right, and it needs to be a big dark uh, area mass of uh, rocks and things like that. It needs to be really big and bold, and that's going to push everything back. So I've gone back and I've put a little bit of a, a scumbly glaze over the areas where the water is falling, so it's a little bit lighter, it's a little bit mistier, and this closer ridge is going to be used to kind of push everything back. I'll have some trees on it, and I just need it to be kind of dark and... Um, it's going to just help bring the foreground closer and uh, push everything else back. I have the waterfall kind of filled in here. It's pretty much dry. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be using some of the liquid and I want to soften up the edges of this when I've kind of, um, this is my base thing bits for the waterfall, but I want to just put some misty bits over it as it falls down. It's very thin. So I'm going to do a kind of a scumbly over the top of it, a little scumble over the top of it with the, um, I'm using a uh, lead white, uh, some of the uh, lamp black, and a little bit of the uh, um, Prussian blue that I want. I don't want it too bright. I don't want it white. I just want it lighter than this dark, so it's going to be in the shadow a little bit. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to get some liquid on my brush, and I'm just going to paint right over the top of it. It's hard to see. It won't show up because it's clear, but I just want something to be able to blend into. So I'm using kind of a just kind of a soft filbert brush, blend right over the top of it. Um, very thinly over the top of this. So I'll add some highlights to some of the green, yellowy brown foliage growing um, in that foreground. I'll uh, use some yellow ochre, some sap green, and some vermilion. And um, once I've kind of blocked in these rocks, once they dry, I go back with a little bit of the liquid and I'll just kind of add a little bit of like another pass over the top of them um, really thinly. And it just kind of gives it a little bit more dimension. It kind of adds to the texture of it. Um, I kind of like it because it kind of unifies them, pushes everything together. And um, then I'll go back and add some highlights and uh, darken up some darks in a little bit. Right here I'm using a um, Rose Matter Lake for my red, uh, mixed with my lemon yellow. Uh, the green, I'm using two different kinds of greens. I'm using a phthalo green and a sap green mixed together. They're both very translucent, transparent. Um, and I'm mixing that with a touch of phthalo blue and manganese blue, which is not necessarily transparent, but I like the color of it. And I want to use more of a phthalo blue. I want more of a brighter um, blue. Uh, this is kind of a gray blue. I want the rainbow to be a touch brighter. So I'm going to be using a little bit of 
a phthalo blue mixed with a touch of the manganese. And then the purple, I'm going to be using deoxinize, deoxyzine, uh, purple. All of these have been mixed with a little bit of flake white. Um, and these will all be mixed with um, liquid original. So we'll see how it goes. So I'm starting the rainbow with a, with a, with a small filbert brush and I've coated it with the liquid original and I have tied my brush, it's kind of hard to see here, but I've tied my brush to a small string that's attached to the bottom of the canvas that's going to give me a perfect arc. And I start by laying in the red, I go to the yellow, and then I start putting in the blue. Um, I'm not going to get too finicky trying to get like the colors in there, I just kind of want the idea of the rainbow. So I might not actually be painting in the green here, I've just done the red, the yellow, and the blue. And because I'm using the transparent paints mixed with the liquid, and I've underpainted it uh, to be brighter, um, then the background uh, rocks and things can kind of show through. over that like rainbow color into them so it kind of like I guess it kind of unifies the front and the back together um, but that is gonna about do it for this painting this is the last thing I needed to do uh, it's pretty much finished up and um, yeah I hope you enjoyed this I liked uh, pretty satisfied with how it turned out if I was to do it again I'd probably might do a couple things different but overall I'm pretty pleased with how it turned out and I uh, hope you like it thanks for watching